Hello, and welcome to the latest in our Insider interview video series. Today, I have with me Paul Marriage, who is manager of the Telworth UK Smaller Companies Fund. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Carl. So, Paul, there are thousands of UK companies for you to potentially invest in. How do you narrow that down to an investable universe? That's a, that's a really good question. There are 1,250 companies we think we could potentially invest in, um, and we want to get that down to 60 stocks. So we start by removing sectors we think are really difficult to understand, very high risk. So we never do oil and gas and mining, and we don't do biotech. High levels of expertise needed there, specific industry expertise. We haven't got that. Let's move on from that. We don't do non-UK companies listed in London, so we only want to do companies where we can get on a, a long train or a short plane to go, go and see those companies' assets. And we don't do micro caps, so nothing under 100 million. Micro cap barrier goes up and down a bit, but for us it's 100 million. So that gets us from 1250 down to about 600. Then we do some quant screens, try and work out which parts of the UK market feel like they're going to be better or relatively better than others. Might help us a little bit in sectors and ideas. And then, most importantly, we meet 300 CEOs and CFOs every year um, of companies uh, that we could potentially invest in. So we've gone from 1250 down to 300. And out of those 300 plus company meetings, we want to pick 60 stocks. And I understand one of those quant screens is a Sinners screen. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. Sinners screen was developed by my colleague Seb Jory a few years ago. So it's a screen that looks for the bad things in companies, the red flags. And the more red flags you've got, the more likely you're, to be in, you're going to end up in the top of the sinner screen. So weak cash flow, maybe poor accounting practices, a lot of boardroom turnover. It's about 17 different things that Seb and the team look at. Uh, so if something's in sinners, we're probably not going to be looking for it in the portfolio. And of the 300 company management teams that you meet every year, what are the key qualities and attributes that you're looking for in a business to win a place in the portfolio? Yeah, broadly, there's two types of stock in our portfolio, a P3M stock and a value opportunity stock. P3M stock, product market margin management. So four attributes we look in, look for in all companies, something I developed probably about 20 years ago now. Uh, we're looking for management who own stock, market leadership of the niche, a differentiated product, and the ability to grow the margin. So kind of core growth company characteristics. Um, uh, and we find if we can find those things, we're in a pretty good place. That's going to be potentially quite a good long-term stock we get in at the right price kind of early in that, that, that company's stock market life. Value opportunity, probably be on the stock market a long time, um, but at some stage has done something wrong. OK company, not a busted flush, doesn't need a massive rescue refinancing. Maybe it's got a bit too much debt. Maybe it's done a slightly bad acquisition. Maybe it needs to do a disposal. But management have got levers to pull, and we think the management are good. So value opportunities, not deep value, but relatively a more interesting place to, to perhaps make some money, probably a slightly shorter holding period than a P3M stock. So it gives us a balanced portfolio. So typically majority P3M uh, and the rest of the portfolio value opportunity. You touched on inflation. How is that influencing your investment decisions at the moment? And could you give a couple of examples of stocks that can potentially weather inflation, perhaps due to having pricing power? It is such a hot topic right now, inflation. And I think no company is ever going to be able to say, oh, no, we're completely immune to inflation because they're simply not. You know, their input costs are going up, their wage costs are going up, and they've got to try and pass that on to their customers, and their customers are going to try and pass that on to their customers. So inflation being passed through the chain is something that all companies have to address. So any company says, no, we're fine on inflation. I'm just not sure that's true. So I guess what we're looking for is the companies with probably the most value add, those companies that have got a product that people really want to buy, really need to buy, and that wage inflation, that cost in input inflation can be passed on through pricing to a degree. One of the key things here is management teams who can manage those expectations quite well. So if you've, there's not much between you know, the cost of the stuff you buy, what you do to it, and what you sell, it's going to be pretty tough. We saw that last year with Acrol, which makes tissue paper and stuff for, uh, 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 and kitchen rolls and things, mainly for the value retailers. It warned very early in the kind of inflation supply chain issue because there's not, you know, there's not much in taking pulp paper. You know, they do it very well, I'm sure they're very good at it, uh, and selling it on to supermarkets. Whereas some of the highest kind of deeper, so AB Dynamics, an interesting business that we own, makes testing systems for cars. So you're developing a new car, auto manufacturers around the world, developing new cars the whole time. You need to test it to meet all those testing requirements for governments 
Um, you still want to sell that car. You want to make sure that when the consumer comes back to buying cars or when the chips to make the cars are available, the full range of cars are available for sale, you're going to carry on testing. So a company like AB Dynamics that sells those testing systems can pretty effectively pass that revenue. And in fact, its order book's been growing really nicely, which suggests it can probably trade through much better than a company with, with thin margins to work with. So, so, you know, there's a couple of examples of one that's going to struggle or has totally strong and one that's so far done quite well. But it's, a, it's pretty rapidly evolving. It seems to be pretty difficult for companies to completely ignore it. I think I heard something from the ONS today, actually, you know, that was saying that 60% of companies are saying we're managing to pass stuff on. 30% of companies are saying we're expecting it to get worse. So, you know, it suggests at some point there's going to be you know, a little bit more tension. Another thing that investors are having to deal with at the moment for the first time in a long time is interest rates moving upwards. How does higher interest rates impact UK smaller companies as they try attempt to grow into larger companies? Have you made any changes to, to the portfolio at all in response to higher interest rates? I think rising rates is less of an issue for small caps perhaps today than it was 10 or even 20 years ago when we've come out of previous cycles with interest rates going up. Um, I think one of the main things is balance sheets are generally in better condition. You know, the last 10 years have been a great opportunity for companies to, to get their balance sheets in good nick post-financial crisis, not get themselves too indebted and have some pretty attractive financing packages. So if you looked at our portfolio, you see a pretty low net debt to EBITDA overall, sort of 0.5 times. So these companies are not borrowing much compared to the EBITDA they've been generating. So short term, don't see too much of an issue around interest rate rises. You know, some companies are on great financing deals and companies with a lot of debt that are on good financing deals are going to refinance at higher rates eventually. Those businesses are going to struggle to get their share price going because the interest rate rises will weigh on EBITDA ultimately or, or on profits rather than not EBITDA. Um, so, yeah, avoiding indebted companies is something we've kind of always done. So pretty relaxed about that actually rising interest rates. One small positive would be companies with big pension deficits. So we've got a couple of companies with big but manageable pension deficits that relate to you know, historic liabilities. Those liabilities become slightly less of a pain in a rising interest rate environment. Are there any particular sectors of the market that you're favouring at the moment? I notice in your top 10 holdings you have a number of industrial companies. Why are you a fan of that sector and could you give a couple of stock examples? Yeah, I think industrials always seem to feature quite highly in portfolios we run. I think partly because it's a really wide definition, uh, but but probably because of that P3M stuff I talked about. And, you know, while I talked about a P3M software company or P3M pub company, P3M does fit widget companies that make stuff. And the studio we're sitting here, and you guys are kitted out really well. A lot of the kit is made by a company we invest in called Vitech, which is the world leader in image capture support equipment. So they don't make the camera, but they make all the tripods and the light panels I can see in this studio today. And image capture is growing massively globally, as I'm sure you're aware. Vitech right at the forefront of that. You know, it's a niche global market making high-end tripods, image capture systems, those Joby gorilla pod things that you probably put your iPhone on to do a TikTok. I'm not sure you do those, Carl, but if you did, you might be using their kit. So, so for us, that, that's the sort of business which has got a great structural growth market, yeah, and, and can probably trade through these conditions. Yeah, probably some semiconductor shortage issues, but something like that, 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 that would be deemed to be an industrial. Uh, and a P3M stock kind of rising at the top of the portfolio. Um, having said that, you know, we do have quite a broad range in there. I think if you looked at our top 10, it's you know, still three or four value opportunity type companies as well. Um, so you might take something like a Harworth Group, uh, which is uh, brownfield land regeneration. Harworth came out of the old National Coal Board, so you can think of something kind of less in vogue. You know, uh, uh, The land that was left after the coal industry closed was put into a property company, um, and that property company now has... Uh, a fantastic range of sites, largely in the north of England. You know, if the levelling up agenda really gets traction, it's really well placed. It's got industrial logistics sites, housing sites, country parks, everything you kind of need to build, you know, eco new towns um, in places where the economy is growing and the economy's got a shortage of high quality buildings. So something like a Harworth, we see that that's trading at a discount to NAV. We see the NAV growing over time. Um, so that'd be a good value opportunity for us. Paul, thank you very much for your time today. Well, thanks very much, Carl. I've really enjoyed it. That's all we have time for for today. You can check out the rest of our Insider interview video series on our YouTube channel where you can like and subscribe. Hopefully see you next time.